Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Rhythm of Life Church. It's a beautiful morning. It's a great day to say hello. It's a great day to praise God. It's a great day to give thanks. I pray that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving with your friends, your family, whatever you did that day. I pray that God met you where you were and that you could feel his presence and that you felt the warmth of his love and that all went well for you. I had a great Thanksgiving and I'm so happy to um, be here today and, and be able to say I had a great Thanksgiving with my children and my grandchildren and my family. And, and I know some people, um, it didn't go so well. There were some arguments, there were some fights, there were police calls. But let us pray for the families that are struggling with one another. Let us pray that they find peace in their hearts with one another. Let us pray that everything will work out for them and that no one would spend any time in jail for their activities on Thursday. But we have to be responsible, church. We've got to be responsible for our attitude. We've got to be responsible for how we react. We have to be responsible for how we represent God and ourselves and our family. Be responsible. The best thing you can do when the heat is too hot in the kitchen is walk away. Just walk away. But we're here today and we have a lot to cover this morning. And so we're going to get right into it and give God all the glory and all the praise. I thank you, Father, for another day. I thank you that you kept us throughout this year. I thank you that you brought us up to this very moment. Lord, we thank you that you woke us up with a portion of our health and our strength and our mental capacity. God, I thank you that you woke us up and the first thing I thought and I pray that we thought was to lift our hands and say thank you, Lord, to lift our hearts and give you the glory and give you the honor. So as we partake of this spiritual bread this morning, God, as we partake of this spiritual food, God, would you feed us? Would you fill us up until we want no more, great Jehovah God? We thank you now and let us find ourselves in your word, Lord, not somebody else, not looking for, oh, that's for so-and-so and that's for this one and that's for that one, but look into your word and find out what is for us specifically, individually, that we can change and that we can be better and we can draw near to you, Lord, and you will draw near to us. This is a prayer I pray for the people of God in Jesus' name, amen and amen. We're going to be in the book of Matthew today, chapter 24, verses 36 through 44. And you know, uh, many of you may know that we are entering the Advent season. And Advent season of Christmas just means we are celebrating the and anticipating the coming of Jesus Christ. And we're excited that God is coming, that his son is coming, and he's going to come a second time as well. But we are preparing in the Advent season to learn more about Jesus, to learn more about his birth, to learn more why he was born in Bethlehem, to learn more why God had him come as God and man to learn more about why he had to come and enter the world through a virgin. We want to learn all we can, God, so we can draw near to you, so you can draw near to us. So as we open up Advent season, Advent season is the four Sundays leading up to Christmas where we, we celebrate and we learn and we teach about the anticipation that we have of the coming Christ. It's not so much about the anticipation of shopping and, and spending all of our money on things that we really don't need, uh, but it's about focusing and centering on the coming of the Christ. And every Sunday, some, some churches and some religions uh, celebrate with the Advent candles and the Advent wreath, and we're going to be teaching about that um, this Sunday and next Sunday. If you'd like to tune in with us at 11 o'clock on Zoom, we're going to teach about the Advent um, ministry, and we're going to teach about the lighting of the candles and the wreath and what they mean. But for now, for this service, we're going to go ahead and light the first candle because this is the first Sunday of Advent. And that may hold or not because the air conditioner is on. But what 
this candle means is that we are living in hope today. We're thinking about hope. There's hope when Jesus comes. There's hope uh, in, the, in the Christ. There's hope in the body of Christ. There's hope in the word of God. There is hope for the believers. There is hope for you and me. So today we're focusing on hope. But I, I, I want to go to Matthew 24, 36 through 44. And our sermon topic this morning is going to be stay awake. Stay awake. Stay alert. Be on guard, church. And so last Sunday, just to recap, we talked about uh, God dealing with us on standing firm in an unshakable kingdom. And God's kingdom is an unshakable kingdom. The word told us last week that every other nation will shake. Every other nation will crumble. But the kingdom of God is unshakable. In the end, the kingdom of God will be standing. God's word was clear that the earth will crumble. And let us rejoice and be exceeding, exceedingly glad because this is good news. Yes, it is. It's good news that those of us who understand kingdom living, who understand God's kingdom, who understand the word of the Lord, we can rejoice and be exceedingly glad because we are living in an unshakable kingdom. Satan cannot tear us down. Satan cannot beat us down. We are living in an unshakable kingdom. So as we get into our word today, today is going to document the beginning of the Advent Christmas season of 2022, as I shared. And Advent just reminds us that Christmas is coming. Jesus is coming. It reminds us of that. Not to go shop, not to go and do all those things that we do in the Christmas spirit that don't lead to the cross, that don't lead to the birth, that don't lead to the, to the return of Jesus. But it reminds us to stay focused. Christ is coming, church. Advent is a season of waiting, recognizing, preparing, understanding, and anticipating the arrival of our Savior. Hallelujah. And this brings me to some facts about the condition of our society as we transition here. Everyone we look at, there's a lot of discussion about what the world needs now and how to fix the things in the world and how to fix our problems. Everyone thinks that they have the answer on how to fix our problems, on how to do things. Everyone is, is, has an idea of what to do and how to do it. Get rid of this, get rid of that one, get rid of this race, do that, do this, uh, tax the poor and let the rich go free. Whatever your thing is, and I'm not saying either of them are correct, but whatever your thing is, uh, it's not going to fix the problem that our society has. But in this passage, Jesus is inviting us to come to an understanding. He's inviting us to come to an understanding about the things that are not obvious to us. Things that we don't know and things that we will never understand unless God explains them to us. So first of all, when we read the word of God, we learn that the problems we are experiencing are greater than man's mind could ever think and greater than man's mind could ever imagine. What the world needs now is, is, is too great for man's comprehension, in my opinion. What we need is too great. It's out of our realm of intelligence. We cannot fix what's going on in the world. So uh, Pastor Zach Pummel uh, said it like this, if it's lower taxes that we want, that's a pretty straightforward and not the hardest thing in the world to do. But if it's redemption, and that's what we're talking about, we've got to get to the spiritual of it all, the spiritual of our society and what's going on in the spirit realm, in our world and in our nation. If it's redemption, that's a different category altogether. And when we talk about redemption, we need a savior. So let's look at Matthew uh, 24, verses 36 through 44. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. And Jesus is telling his, his, his audience and his disciples to be watchful, to be alert. And it reads, however, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's days. 
In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered the ark. Verse 39, people didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of God comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other will be left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Verse 42, so you too must keep watch. Stay alert, church. Stay alert. Stay awake. For you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Verse 43, understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. The last verse, 44. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of God will come when we least expect him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Can the church say amen for the word of God? Amen for the word of God. So Matthew 24, 36 through 44 is an extended invitation to realize what the world really needs. Do you know what the world really needs? If you do, just put it in the chat for me. I'll be reading them later, but I'm going to say it now. It needs Jesus. It needs a Savior. Everything and everyone are in the throes of birthing pains down here on earth. We're birthing this. We're birthing that. We're struggling with this. We're struggling with that. We're trying to change this. We're trying to change that. We're trying to do this. We're trying to do that. We are struggling and in the throes of birthing pains. We may not always be aware of it, but we need to be mindful of it. We may um, uh, look for Jesus in all the wrong places, but if we look for him in the world, in the word of God, and in the uh, atmosphere of, of the word of God, then we will find that redemption can change all things. Somebody needs redeeming. And until everyone is redeemed and understand that they need redeeming, we have a problem down here. Uh, the Bible and the book goes on to say, um, as uh, Pastor Pullman said, we further must discuss that the desires that lie behind your breath are being taken away by the beautiful sunset every time. In other words, when he's saying, you open up your eyes to a beautiful sunset like we did here in California or last evening when the sun was setting down and the sun is coming up, uh, you got something to be grateful for. You have something to be thankful for. And that's the desire that lies behind the gnawing in your gut that something is missing because when you look at the sun rising and you look at the sun setting, you feel the glory of God, but you may not understand it. When you see the sun rising and setting, you may not understand what the, the glory and the beauty and that peaceful feeling you have, but that is God speaking to you through nature. And when we think about it in the book of Revelation, the word of God says, surely I am coming soon. When you see me rising and setting, surely you must know that I am who I say I am and I am coming soon. But you might ask the question, uh, when can we expect him to come? Well, this word that we just read in our passage of scripture, Jesus tells us about what we can expect. He's telling us about the end of all things when he returns. But he doesn't tell us when we can expect his arrival. And that's disappointing because if we expected, if we knew when they were coming, if our dinner guests are coming to the house at 3 o'clock, we know we need to be ready for them by 2 o'clock. But instead, what Jesus says in verse 36 of our passage, and I'm going to reread it, he says, no one knows the day and no one can know the hour, not even the angels, not even he, Jesus himself, the son of God, knows his scheduled return. So stay awake. Stay awake, church. Stay vigilant. Vigilant. Stay alert. Be a watchman for Jesus' return because he said, surely I am coming soon. Surely there will be a return. He said it, surely I 
am coming soon in Revelation 22, 20. Well, I want to describe to you what a watchman is because we as believers must be watchmen. Henry Blackaby elaborated on the watchman as noted in Matthew 13 when God says that every believer has been given eyes to see and ears to hear. And Pastor Beverly is saying, you have those eyes that God gave you, but you don't always look for Jesus. You're looking how you can satisfy yourself. You're looking for what can please you. You have these ears, but you don't always use those ears to read the word of God and hear God speaking to you. You don't always use those ears to listen to prayers and listen to his teach word. You don't always use those ears to read his word and sit still and allow him to speak the meaning of his word back to you. But a watchman, a watchman must be equipped by God to see what others cannot see. Your eyes have to be sanctified and anointed. We can't be looking at the things of the world. We can't be looking at her and him and, 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 and looking for eye candy. We can't be looking for all those things that will bring, bring us pleasure. A watchman must be equipped by God to see what others cannot see. The watchman can see when the enemy is invading God's territory. The watchman can see when the enemy is invading our homes or individuals. The watchman can see things that other people cannot see. The enemy comes disguised, but a spiritual watchman is very alert. A spiritual watchman blows the trumpet and sounds the alarm. They give a sound so that family members can be quickly warned and not destroyed. A watchman. Are you a watchman? Are you a watchman? The watchman has also been given spiritual eyes to see things that are happening in the life of our churches. The watchman realizes that the devil has come in with turmoil in the church. The devil has come in with dissension in the church. The devil has brought in conflict, lies, and deceit in the church. And his purpose is to destroy God's church by any means necessary. But a watchman, one who's watching over the flock like a pastor or a deacon, the watchman doesn't just see and observe or hear. The watchman blows the trumpet and the watchman is in the whistle. He's the whistleblower in the spiritual realm. He's warning the people, warning, warning, Satan has arrived. Satan is in the, has infiltrated our territory. The watchman sounds the alarm. He warns the pastor and the leaders that the enemy has entered the flock and is seeking to do harm. Stay alert. Stay awake, church. This is what this passage is about. Stay alert. Get ready for Jesus' coming. Get ready for Jesus' return. Stay alert. This watchman watches day and night over God's pastors and, and the sheep, and, and he warns the pastor, and he or she tells the pastor what's going on in the church, and God will use them to make the pastor aware so that the pastor can teach the right lessons and approach the people with truth and spirit and help them turn the rudder and come back and live in their redemption and in this unshakable kingdom of God. Jesus will return. Make a note of that. He will return. You can tell yourself every morning that you get up, Jesus will return. And ask yourself, will I be ready when he returns? Am I a watchman or am I part of the problem? No one is privy to the timing of Jesus' return. We, we've established that. Only the Father in heaven knows when Jesus will be released from heaven to fulfill his second coming. Will you be ready, church? Will you be the watchman on the wall? Will you sound the alarm? Will you be the whistleblower? Hear ye, hear ye. The day of the Lord is coming. Hear ye, hear ye. Will you be the one to drop to your knees in prayer? Will you be the one that's causing the dissension in the church, in the family, in the body of Christ? Will you be the one that's initiating conflict? Will you be the one with the lies and deceit in your heart? Or will you be the watchman on the wall, whistleblowing, sounding the alarm, exposing Satan for who he is? I imagine that some of you may be wondering, if we can't know the timing of Jesus' return, then why is Jesus even telling us this? Why do we need to know it? 
What are we su supposed to do with this information? Well, he tells us this so that we will stay awake, church. That we will be alert. That we won't fall asleep on our jobs. That we won't fall, a fall asleep on our responsibilities to God. Why? Because redemption and judgment will come when Jesus, when Jesus returns. They are all real. Judgment is real. Judgment is real. Redemption is real. Redemption is real. And they will come when Jesus returns. They lie at the door at the end of history, redemption and judgment. All of our lives will be boiled down to those two single realities, redemption and judgment. Redemption and judgment. Jesus says in verse 42, therefore, stay awake. You do not know the day or the hour that the Lord is coming. Stay awake. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of God is coming at an hour that you cannot expect. Stay awake. You stay awake by meeting at the group at prayer. You stay awake by studying in Bible study. You stay awake by learning that word and applying that word. You stay awake by being a watchman. You line up everything with the word of God. Stay awake, church. Pray over your food. Pray over your situations. Pray over your household. Pray over this nation. Seek God for everything. Stay alert. Stay awake. Jesus tells us about his coming. And even though we do not know when that will happen, he wants us to live with the assurance that he is coming. He says, surely I am coming. He's coming soon. And because of that, he says, do not fall asleep. Stay awake. Be a watchman. Many of us are sleepwalking. Every day we get up, it's about what I'm going to watch on television, what I'm going to eat, what I'm going to buy, who I'm going to call on the phone, who I'm going to text. It's all about you. But wake up from that dream. Stop sleepwalking. Stop sleepwalking. And what does it mean to, to fall asleep? Well, it just helps us understand in verse 37 of this pastor passage, he says, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of God. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. Secondly, the people in Noah's day ignored Noah all the way up to the final hour. Noah had come to them and said, I don't know when, but the heavens will open up and you need an ark. So church, I don't know when Jesus is coming, but I do believe according to this word that he is coming. And you need an ark. You need a covering. Uh, Noah was offering them a covering. Get in the boat. Get in the boat. Turn from your wicked ways. Get in the boat. The heavens are going to open and the rain is going to come and the flood will destroy. But the people ignored him, just like the people are ignoring the teaching and preaching of God today. People don't want to hear about God because they think they can't have a life if they do it God's way. But God is love. God is truth. God is spirit. God is everything you need to make it in this world. And Noah's people ignored the preacher. Noah's people ignored God's messenger. Noah's people disobeyed because they were more into serving themselves than learning about God. You need an ark because God has provided a way for you. You need a covering. Come into the house of God. Come into the church. Join the believers. Pray with us. Walk with us. Talk with us. Sing with us. Worship with us. Study with us. And you can rest assured, Jesus is coming. Will you be ready? Will you be ready when he comes? Will you be a watchman on the wall? Will you be alert? Will you be awake? But what did they do in Noah's day? They ignored him. And so the call is going out. I'm the watchman today and I'm sounding the alarm. The enemy is in the camp. The enemy is in your heart. The enemy is in your home. The enemy is in your thoughts and your mind. The enemy is in your hands and your feet and what you do with them. I'm sounding the alarm today. Come in, come in, come in, come in before the flood comes, before the rain comes. But they ignored him. 
They ignored him to the very end, all the way up to the day that Noah and his family entered the ark. They refused to hear about God. I don't want you to be one of the ones that refuses to hear about God. How did they ignore him? Jesus is describing it. He's describing it what it looks like when we fall asleep. They were asleep. They were only about serving themselves and having a good time and having a party and, and having all the things that made them happy. They were eating, drinking, and marrying as though they knew the future and what the future had for them. They didn't know what lied ahead of them as if nothing was coming for them but what they wanted to come to them. In short, church, these people in Noah's days lived as though they were going to live forever. Message, call out, pause. You are not going to live forever. You need an ark. You need a covering. As they were in control, they thought they were in control, but they didn't realize they needed God's covering. They were living as though the world was all theirs. And that it would be here forever. But the word said last week, the earth will crumble. It will shake. Nations will crumble. But the kingdom of God will stand forever because it's a what? It's an unshakable kingdom. Lastly, the people of, 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 of Noah's days, they ignored God's grace. We keep ignoring God's grace. They ignored his warnings to look up and be prepared. And God is calling you today, look up and be prepared. I am coming soon. Stay awake, church. Stay awake. And realize that judgment and redemption are real things and they are coming with me. He's coming to redeem and he will be judging when he comes. The people of Noah's days ignored, 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 ignored Noah. And they focused on their own bellies, filling their own guts, having a good time and having their own satisfaction. They ignored him. They ignored him, church. Instead, they focused on marrying off their kids and, and getting their families situated in society. And they and focused on well-positioned jobs and, and their future that would never come to them because Jesus was coming. God was coming. There was a coming of the Christ. And, and they would not be ready because they were focusing on the things of the world, the things that were important to them. They were the people that only looked down and what was right in front of them. And that's what we do. We look down. We look around at what's right in front of us. And they never looked up. They never looked up to understand is there more to this life than what the world has to offer. Finally, when they felt the rain come down, then and only then did they look up. Don't wait till the rain comes. Don't wait till the storm comes. Don't wait till the trouble comes. Don't wait till Jesus returns. It's too late. The flood was already rising over the sun horizon. Choose ye today. Today will you serve God. Will you be the watchman on the wall watching over God's people, watching over your pastor, watching over the leaders of your church? The people of Noah's day fell asleep. And church, I'm waking you up today, shaking you. Wake up. Wake up. There was no reaching these people. No matter how hard Noah pleaded with them, no matter how hard your pastors preach and your teachers teach, there's no reach, reaching some of us because we have fallen asleep to the things of God. Wake up, America. Wake up. We fall asleep when we live as though this life is all there is. There is more to just, to life than just this world. This world will not last forever. We preached that last Sunday. It will crumble. God said it, and that settles it. We fall asleep when we, we, we don't understand the world's problems, so we fall asleep on them. Oh, well, I'm not going to worry about it. We'll let someone else take care of it. When we possess what it takes to fix the problem, and what we possess is the power of the Holy Spirit, all we've got to do is speak a word to God and things will change. All we have to do is speak a word and be on one accord and things will change. We have fallen asleep. When we focus on worldly affairs, we are asleep. And we are ignoring God's affairs. Do you hear me, 
church? Am I reaching anybody? Are you understanding? Are you are you tracking what I'm saying? I mean, this is serious business. Christmas is here. Advent is here. And we need to be focusing on the coming of Christ. But many of us, as I went to the store yesterday to pick up um, my candles, um, the store was packed. People said it's uh, uh, inflation and things are too expensive. But the store was packed and the lines were long and people were shopping till they dropped. Their carts were full. Something is wrong with that picture. We can't have inflation and, and, and things are too high and we're out here spending up everything we have for Christmas. But that's not Christmas. Christmas is celebrating the coming of Jesus Christ. It's his birthday. What can we give him for his birthday? We become fixated and absorbed by politics and, and current events, by family and career. We're living the good life and getting all of things situated just how we want them. At what cost? We fall asleep when our lives revolve on the things of this world. When you all you think about is what you can get from this world, you're asleep. Wake up. And what we do. And how we do it, we only look down and around. We never look up to the heavens from whence cometh our help. And the Bible says our help cometh from the Lord. We treat earthly affairs as though they were eternal affairs. And we fall asleep to the deeper realities of our existence. Our existence goes deeper than just what this world has to offer. Jesus is encouraging us in this passage of scripture to lay hold of what he is teaching us, which begins with recognizing that the problems of this world are bigger than we could ever know, imagine, or think, yet alone try to solve. And when we underestimate the world's problems, which we do, we underestimate them. We think we can fix them, but some of this is too too great too great for us. We can't even comprehend the core of it, the root of it. Uh, when we ignore uh, this, we ignore God. We begin to place our hopes in the powers of this world, in the systems of this world, in the voices of this world, and in the offerings of this world. Wake up, church. We're entering Advent season. <coughs> We're entering Christmas season, and we need to enter with our eyes wide open, spiritually wide open. We place our hope on things that free us. We remake the world how we want it to be, and we make it how we imagine it. We believe that the world's problems can be solved by legislation and the right leaders and the right this and the right that, or our lives can finally be at peace through a job, through titles and remodels and, and the right tax bracket and so on and so on, but we are asleep. We are asleep to the things of God. We are in this world as believers, but we are not of this world, so why are we focusing on the things of this world? The world constantly pulls uh, a, a gaze uh, downward and, and we fall asleep. The world is constantly infiltrating us with what they want us to have and what they think we should have and what they think we should do. And we fall asleep to the things of God. We fall asleep when we place our hope in the world's reality. They have a pill for everything. Your toe hurts, here's a pill for it. Your head hurts, here's a pill for it. Your finger hurts, your fingernail, it, there's a pill for it. It may cause all of this, but it will take care of your finger. It will take care of your toe. It will take care of your headache, but it may cause all of this. Now, granted, some of it we need to take, but we have to be careful. Seek God in everything, even our medical treatment. How do we stay awake and how do we stay ready? Well, I answered that question for myself that when we stay awake and we stay ready when we stop being dependent on the world system, when we stop being dependent on what the world has to offer, when we lose hope in the things of the world and place our hope in Jesus, that's how we can stay awake. That's how we can be alert. When we live with our hope in Jesus and not in the world, that's how we can wake up and stay awake. Politics are important. Yes, they are. To lay a hold of the freedoms that we have been given, that's important. To take part in seeking justice, that's important. To protect life and liberty, that's important. But don't give it all your hope. Our hope should be in Jesus Christ. 
Powers come and powers go. People come and people go. But the word of God remains forever. It will stand the test of time. Can nobody do you like Jesus? Can nobody love you like Jesus? Can nobody hold you like Jesus? Can nobody talk to you like Jesus? Can nobody get you out of that pit of hell that you're in with Jesus? Stay awake. Staying awake is learning to live with that deep longing within you that Jesus is teaching us to, today, right now, today. And learning to live with that longing for redemption that will never fully be realized in this life, but it will be realized in Jesus and Jesus alone. Redemption can be realized through Jesus. Staying awake is learning to live with the disappointment that comes, with the discouragement and the frustration of the world without giving in to the world. We have to learn to live with frustration. Why? Because we have a God who can do anything but fail. We have a God that's Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. We have a God that loves us beyond anything and anybody. Can't nobody love you like Jesus. That's why the second coming is for those who long for more. You know the world can't satisfy you. The minute you get what you long for, two weeks later, two months later, you're ready for something else. That's worn out. That's old. We need something new. We need to be refreshed all over again. The second coming is for those who long for more. Do you long for more? Do you want more? Do you want that spiritual fulfillment that only God can provide? Do you want to be in that unshakable kingdom that will not crumble when the rest of the world is crumbling? Put your hope in the rider, the rider, King Jesus. One day the, cry, the sky will crack and open and King Jesus will come riding down. And that says he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. But when is he coming? We don't know. We don't know the hour. So that's why we have to stay awake. We have to be alert and we have to prepare ourselves. Stop your ugly. Whatever your ugly is, stop it now in the name of Jesus. Because people with discernment and watchman eyes, they see you for who you are. So just let's go ahead and put it away. Bury the coffin and let's walk in the righteousness and the holiness and the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God. No one knows, but God knows. Trust God. Trust God. Today, now, we're entering Advent season. Let's think about the things of God. His word is true, church. His word is true. And this world will come to pass, but the kingdom of God will never pass. It stands forever. So when we look at verse 42 and 44 as we get ready to close. Verses 42, 43, and 44, it says, so you must keep watch. I'm not making this up. This is the word of God. It's very, much, very little of it is coming from me personally. So you must keep watch, for you don't know what day the Lord is coming. You don't know. So don't live your life today being unprepared. Today, get prepared. Whatever you need to change, whatever is in you that is not of God, you need to bring it under arrest and to put it under the authority of the Holy Spirit today. Understand this, the word says, if a homeowner knew exactly when a thief was going to rob their home, he would keep watching, not permit his house to be broken into. Verse 44, you also must be ready all the time for the Son of God will come when you least expect him. Get ready, church. It can't be any plainer than that. I don't even need to elaborate on that. It's plain. If you knew somebody was getting ready to rob you, you'd be sitting up waiting for them. You'd have the police hiding around waiting for them to come through. Well, you don't know when Jesus is coming. And just like you would sit up to protect your personal worldly belongings, sit up and protect your spiritual belongings. Sit up and respect and, and protect your, your inheritance by learning to trust God, by learning to live for God, by learning to be holy and righteous, by learning to stay awake and being the watchman on the wall, by learning to pray without ceasing, by learning to study to show thyself approve a workman that can rightly divide the word of truth. Study, church. We are much better off, I believe, that we don't know when Christ is going to return. And think about it as we get ready to wrap this up. Number one, if many of us knew the exact time Jesus was going to return, 
Would we be diligently and efficiently sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ? Would we live in obedience to God daily if we knew exactly when he was going to come? Number three, would we learn all that we could through Bible study if we knew exactly when he was going to come? Would we attend the prayer gatherings on a regular basis or would we be nonchalant and lazy in our work for Christ if we knew exactly when he was going to come? Or would we keep sinning because we have calculated how much time we have before we have to straighten up and fly right and act right, do right and obey God so we clean up at the last minute? The Bible is very clear, church, that no one knows when Jesus is returning. Not man, nor angels, not even the Son of God. Only the Father knows. Christ's second coming will be swift. We do know that. And it will be sudden. It will be unexpected. There won't be an opportunity for last minute, minute repentance. There won't be an opportunity for you to say, God, forgive me. I'm sorry. Take me with you. I didn't know, God. Give me another chance. There will be no time in that second coming. There will be no opportunity to bargain with God for your salvation when he arrives. It'll be too late. When the Son of God returns, whatever choice we made while living our lives will determine our eternal destiny. And one of the songs we used to sing when we were growing up is Get Right Church and Let's Go Home. We need to get right church and prepare to go home because there is a coming where Jesus will bring judgment and redemption. Stay awake. Be a watchman. Sound the alarm against the enemy and let the righteous know that he has come. Rally together to shut the enemy down. That's how we do it. We rally together to shut the the enemy down. We have the power to do that through the Holy Spirit. Shut him down. Block him out. Cut him out. Kick him out. He has no authority over you unless you give him the authority over you. Be alert for your marriages. Be alert for your children. Be alert for this nation. Be awake and stay awake for our communities, for our lost for the lonely, for the hurting, for the brokenhearted, for the homeless, those less fortunate. Be awake. Even the wealthy people, be awake. Share the gospel wherever you go. Live the gospel in whatever you do. Show up in the gospel in whatever wherever you go. Show up as Christ's ambassadors anticipating his return. For all people and every nation will be affected by Christ's return. I promise you that. All people, all nations will be affected when Christ's return. Stay alert. Stay awake. Be vigilant. This is Advent season. This is the word of God for the people of God. I hope I got the message through clear. If I didn't, go back and read this passage, Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 through 44. Church, I want to make a few announcements, but before I do that, I want to extend an invitation. If there's anyone who has heard this word and would like to give their lives to Christ, if you heard God speaking to you and you know that you haven't been, been village, vigilant, yeah. see the devil always wants to tie up your tongue so you can't get that message out, but he's a liar because I push through anyway, and that's what I encourage you to do, push through anyhow. There's no embarrassment, there's no shame in serving God. But if, God, if you've heard God speaking to you and you want to give your life to Christ, you can do that this morning. You can do that. All you have to do is invite him into your heart. You can say a simple prayer and Jesus will come into your heart. Father, forgive me of my sins. I am a sin. But today I realize you are God and you are God alone. So come into my heart. Dwell in me. I surrender myself to you today. If you pray that prayer, I want to say welcome into the body of Christ. Get into a Bible teaching church and allow God to grow you and stretch you and teach you more about who he is and his purpose for your life. 
Rhythm of Life is a virtual church, and we would love to have you virtually with us. We get together every now and then to celebrate with one another, to fellowship, and we would love to have you right here with us. Bible study on Zoom, prayer on Zoom, Sunday morning service right here on Facebook Live, events, December 10th is coming up. We do it all, prayer conferences. We have December 10th coming up. That's our seventh annual Christmas Acts of Kindness for the Homeless. And you can go on our Facebook page or our website and go ahead and register for the event. We have two dynamic speakers. One will talk about the need from a, a secular perspective and uh, another will talk about the need from a biblical perspective. We have giveaways for some of you. This is the time that we say thank you to our donors. We typically have a luncheon, but since COVID came, we've not had that luncheon in two and a half years, which would be, this would be our third year. But next year, we're going live again with our luncheon, if God is willing, and we'll have a live thank you party, just to say thank you for all the support you give. And I'm telling you, you have given lots of money, to help us feed the homeless and those less fortunate at Christmas. And this year, I pray, will be no different. We will be supporting the Corona Norco Settlement House. And we've already met with them. And we know exactly what their need. And we are working and pushing for those donations. So we can get those pictures out and show, look what we did. We are doing the work. We are out in the field. We are helping others that are less fortunate. We are doing what Christ did. He helped us and now we're helping others. So that's it for today. Have a great day on purpose because you can. Some of us will be meeting at 11 o'clock today, even though we're not having Bible study until the first of the year. We're going to be talking and learning about the Advent season, what these candles mean and what this wreath means, and so that we can be educated in the things of God. So if you'd like to Zoom in with us, the Zoom number is on our Facebook page and it's also on our website. So until we meet again, be blessed. Remember, this is the day of hope. We're hoping and, and looking for Jesus to return. So extend hope to others today. Bye-bye.